Well, we want to hop right into it, get right into our Mother's Day message, because I know that uh, many of us have plans for today, uh, either plans to go see our mothers, plans to go out and grab a bite. Uh, we all have plans. So I want to dive right into my message uh, this morning. First of all, uh, I have a story to share with you. I don't normally start with a joke, uh, but this is a, something I found quite humorous. I, I want to read this to you. When a group of tourists visited a crocodile farm, the owner of the place launched a bold proposal. Whoever dares to jump, swim to the coast, and survive, I will give you a million dollars. No one dared to move. Suddenly, a man jumped into the water and desperately swam to the shore while being chased by all the crocodiles. With enormous luck came, uh, taking everyone's admiration at the scene. Then the owner announced, we have a brave winner. After collecting his reward, the couple returned to the hotel. Upon arrival, the manager told him he was very brave to jump. Then the man said, I didn't jump. Someone pushed me. His wife smiled. The moral of the story is this. Behind every successful man, there's a woman who pushes him. All right? And all the ladies said, <laughs> amen. I, I, thought, I thought you'd enjoy that today on Mother's Day, but let me tell you, moms, uh, we really do love you and we really do appreciate you. In fact, uh, salary.com decided that they would crunch some numbers together and, and figure out what is the worth, right, uh, of, of what the mom does, right? If you got paid a full-time salary to do your job, well, this is what they came up with as of 2019. The numbers for 2020 aren't even in yet, but so you can imagine. Imagine how high this number went, but it's uh, if you got paid for everything that you do on a on a on a daily basis, uh, your salary would be upwards of one hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars for the year. All right, so ladies, don't get any ideas going back to your husbands and saying, "Listen, um, we need to talk a, a little bit of a raise here." Uh, but one hundred seventy thousand, uh, seventy eight thousand uh, dollars. The survey determined that an average number of hours a stay at home mom actually works is more than ninety hours per week. An analysis from Ocfem uh, in 2020 figured out that unpaid work by women in the U.S., such as house cleaner, cook, child care, driver, laundry service, etc., 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 would be worth $1.5 trillion in 2019, using minimum wage per hour for its calculations. And again, that's 2019. You know what happened 2020. So I don't even want to see the numbers. What does concern me is, I wonder what happened on 29, 2009 that the numbers dipped a little bit. Not really sure what happened there. Uh, moms might have gone on strike or something, but uh, we see that they tried to put a price on really something that is absolutely priceless. What you do, moms, is absolutely priceless. Today, because you work so hard and you do so much, I decided not to preach my original sermon. My original sermon for today was going to be 31 reasons why you cannot be a Proverbs 31 woman, uh, but I thought I'd give you a break. And today, I don't want to preach to moms. I don't want to preach to moms. So moms, you can tune me off, tune me out. Uh, you, this is, message is not for you. This message is actually for your husbands and children. So if you came here today and your children are with you, kudos to you. You did well for yourself. And they're about to listen to a message that's directly to them about you. And if you're tuning online through Facebook, uh, you might want to get your kids over and say, you need to watch this with me. Because today's sermon is not for our moms. Moms, you get a break. How many of you could use a break? None? I'll preach a sermon for moms if you need me to. No, no, you can use a break. So I want to give you a break. It's a well-deserved break. And uh, you take off today. You don't have to listen to a word I say. However, children and, uh, and husbands... You need to tune in and you need to pay close attention because today's sermon is all about what moms need of us. And we're going to take the lives of three women in the Bible. Uh, one by the name of Naomi. You may remember her from the book of Ruth. 
Um, we, we're going to talk a little bit about her. Then we're going to talk about Samuel's uh, mother, Hannah. Hannah, uh, her name means grace. I absolutely love. In fact, uh, fun fact, Ava's middle name comes from Hannah's name, Grace. And uh, the reason she only made it to a middle name is because I actually wanted to name her Hannah because Hannah means grace. But um, I had to talk to my wife about that and she wasn't crazy about the name Hannah. So I got the second place middle name, Grace. Uh, but we're going to talk about Hannah and, and the type of mother that she was. And then we're going to talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. These three women that are absolutely exemplary, uh, but really not so much talking about them, but rather talking about how we treat our mothers. So we're going to start with Naomi. Naomi, uh, kids, children, husbands, pay attention because this is the first thing. It's not the only thing that our moms need from us, but I believe that this is a big one. The first thing that I believe moms need from us is that moms need our love when they feel lost. Moms need our love when they feel lost. Now, I know that sounds almost like an oxymoron, like what? A mom lost? Yes, have you seen them driving on 287? I'm kidding. No. Moms lost. We think of mothers as being such exemplary, powerful, strong women. And that they are for sure. They are strong. And they are indeed powerful. And they can endure a lot. However, there are times when even mothers feel lost. There are times when even a mother feels maybe even abandoned. Even, dare I say, abandoned maybe even by God. Naomi was such a woman that felt lost. And there were opportunities for people to love on her even though she felt lost. And yet one person took the challenge. I'll I'll spoil it here. Her name was Ruth. She loved. Orpah loved but not nearly as much. I want to talk to you about this story in case you don't know it. I want to read it to you. It says this. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons. The man's name was Elimelech and his wife was Naomi. Can you say Naomi? Naomi, that's the lady we're talking about. Their two sons were Malon and Kilion. Uh, They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. So this is a couple just decides that they're going to move to Moab because there is a famine in their land. There is tragedy. There are bad things happening, bad days. So they say, we're going to go to Moab. We're going to go to a place that's better for us right now. Then Elimelech, the husband, died. And Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah. A fun fact about Orpah there, by the way. Do you know that Oprah Winfrey was meant to be called Orpah? Uh, That was supposed to be her name, but uh, there was a mix-up at the hospital, as the story goes, where they switched her name. But nevertheless, the two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other married a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilion now died. So now not only does her husband die, both of her sons die. So she is left alone with her two daughter-in-laws. Then it happened that Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So now she's in Moab and she's with her two daughter-in-laws But she hears that back home, things are back to normal. Things are getting better. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, she says, Go back to your mother's homes and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husband and to me. 
May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. So she's saying, listen, thank you so much for enduring this with me, for going through these this tragic season of our lives. Uh, thank you for being there with me, but, but you ladies run along. You go ahead and, and you get married and you start new families. Why would you want to stay with me? Now, Naomi gets a bad name typically in sermons because everybody talks about how her name means bitter. And they try to say how bitter she was. And, and I don't know that I want to judge her that quickly. I, I just think this woman, if anything, she was a kind woman. She's saying, listen, you go on and, and you live your life. Obviously, God hasn't been kind to me, but, but let God be kind to you. You've been kind to me. Go have fun. Go enjoy your lives. Really, really, I mean, I, I feel like I, I, I sense her heart in that. It must have been really difficult for her to share that. And she says, I want you to go and find security in another marriage. Now, just to give you a little bit of context to show you what this whole thing means. As it turns out, women in these times, they weren't valued uh, like they are today. They, it wasn't the same, uh, not because God didn't want them to be valued, but rather it was just the sinfulness of man. We really didn't value women like that. And by the sinfulness of man, I'm not just talking about men, males. I'm talking about just the sinfulness of man as a humanity. So when it came to women, women did not have their own jobs. They were typically just homemakers. They were just somebody that would take care of the family in the home. Uh, so for a woman to really make it in life, she needed the protection, the security of her husband. She needed that, you know, she couldn't just go out and get a job like ladies today can go out and get a job. It was a little different. So they needed the protection of their husband. So she says, go find the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye and they all broke down and wept no they said we want to go with you and your people I want you to think about that I want you to put yourself right there put yourself with these three women as they are discussing life and what is going to happen next in life and Naomi just probably in tears telling them go ahead you're the only thing I have left in life but you go ahead and, and you go make your life. You go find the security of another husband. Orpah and Ruth also wept because they know how difficult the season this has been. And they're saying, no, no, we, we don't want to go. We want to stay with you, Naomi. We want to be with you. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? Uh, and again, they wept together and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. So Orpah is like, you right. You can't have another child that I can marry that will protect me. You right. I love you, Naomi, but peace. I am out. But Ruth, this is awesome, clung tightly to Naomi. Ruth says, I'm not going anywhere. That, what I said before, that wasn't a joke. That wasn't pretend. You know how people pretend to be nice until it's due time, right? It's go time. And, and all of a sudden, they're not as nice. And then they show their true colors. Anybody seen that? Ruth clung to her tightly to Naomi. She says, look, Naomi. Um, Naomi says to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back whenever you go. I will go wherever you live. I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Ruth says, I'm staying here regardless. You know, in, in every one of our lives, there's going to be a moment when our mothers, frankly, aren't as, I, I want to say this carefully, but, but I want you to hear, hear what I'm getting at. There comes a moment as you mature and you grow up that suddenly you don't depend on, on your mom as much as you used to. 
You, you get to this place where now you're independent. You get to this place where you've got it under control. And, and your mother, uh, she's valuable because of the value that God is giving her. But the reality is that she's not essential to your well-being. You could go on without her. And there comes a point in every one of our lives when, when I don't really need my mother anymore. And that's a difficult time. That's a difficult transition for a woman, a mom, someone who has always found their value in caring for you and taking care of you, all of a sudden to find themselves in a place where they're no longer, they no longer have to be that same caregiver because you can go on your own. That's a difficult transition for a woman. And for us children, what do we do at that point? When we realize, I don't need mom like I used to need mom. What, what do we do? Do we say, well, we're done. Thank you so much for what you've done. I'll run along. I'll never call you again. I'll never visit again. I'll just be out there somewhere. You did everything you needed to do. Now I'm good to go. No. It's those moments when women find themselves at a loss. And they weep and it's, it's difficult for them because... What they define themselves as, as a mother, all of a sudden, that's no longer there. I'm no longer mom. I'm no longer the one that they depend on. And that's difficult. And they're at a loss. What do we need to do in those moments? That's when we come back in, children. That's when we love them more. Our moms need our love when they feel lost. Our moms need our love. See, Ephesians 5.25 says this, for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And how did he love the church? He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Children, husbands, we need to get to the place where We love our moms, we love our wives, and we don't just love them because of the benefit that we can get from them, but rather we love them because of who they are, because they're valuable to God, they're valuable to us, and it's important that when they're lost, we let them know, you're not lost, I'm here with you, and I'm going to pull in, and I'm going to come back in, I'm going to love you right now. So that's the first woman, Naomi. Thank God for Ruth, for what she did with Naomi. The second woman is Hannah. Hannah. Um, Hannah shows us something different that our mothers need. The truth is that our mothers need to be commended more than they need to be criticized. Can I hear an amen? I'm thinking those were women that were moms, but our moms need to be commended more than they need to be criticized. It's so easy to be critical of our wives. It's so easy to be critical of our moms. Uh, It's so easy. But guess what? It's also easy to give compliments. It is. It's just as easy. It just takes a little more thought. It just takes a little more thinking. Like when you have that urge to be critical and criticize, maybe what you should do is take a step back and say, no, I'm going to be an encouragement to a mother. Rather than look at a mother and say, look at the way your children are behaving. Maybe you can point out something else about her children. Maybe how good looking their children are. Or maybe how well dressed they are. Or whatever it is. But our moms, moms, what you do is amazing. And to get even your children to church, I know how difficult it can be. Moms, you need to be children. We need to know that we need to be commending our moms more than criticizing our moms. And that goes for both children and, uh, and dads. We need to be commending our moms. See, this is what happened in the story of Hannah. Hannah, uh, the story starts with this man called Elkanah. He had two wives. He had two wives, Hannah and Penina. I need to stop there just for a moment and make a brief parenthesis here. Because you might real, you might read that and you'll say, what, what, what is going on here? There was a man with two wives and the Bible is okay with that? Well, let me tell you something about the Bible that you may not know. When you read scriptures, there's two things that the Bible will typically have. Uh, one is a description 
Another one is a prescription. Okay? Let me explain that. A description is when the Bible describes something just as it is. The Bible is not prescribing that. It's not saying, go ahead and find yourself a second wife. The Bible is not saying to do that. In fact, if you read the rest of the Bible, you realize that God's plan for marriage is one man, one woman, not one man, two women, or one man, multiple women, or any other variation that you can think of. It's one man, one woman. This is what the Bible teaches. And when the Bible tells us that Elkanah has two wives, it's not prescribing that you get two wives, but rather it is describing what was happening. Again, because of the sinfulness of man, there were things that were happening that just weren't necessarily godly, but they were happening. So it's just a description. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. Each year, Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord uh, at that time were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. Phinehas, On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina and her children. So each of her children got a portion for the sacrifice. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. Now, in other translations, the Bible says that he gave her a double portion. I I want you to know that there's a little bit of debate between that, uh, whether it was one special portion that kind of equaled two portions. Was it a a bigger portion? Regardless, what, what you need to know is that it was a special portion. And the reason why it was a special portion is because she had no children. So to Hannah, he had a little more empathy toward her. And by the way, the Bible says that he actually loved her. Uh, and, and it gives the impression that he loved her more than he loved Penina. That's what happens when you have a husband that has two wives. So don't do it. So Penina uh, would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. And year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why are you downhearted? Why be downhearted? Just because you have no children. And then he says, you have me. Isn't that better than having ten sons? To which I imagine Hannah totally rolling her eyes. Like really you? Like you are better than ten children? No, I'd rather have ten children. Um, but, but you see, here, here's what I want you to get at. And, and kids, husbands, this is what I want you to understand. And it's that sometimes we don't, we don't get our moms. Sometimes we don't get our spouses. And right here, there's a prime example uh, of a man, uh, a Christian man, for as as far as we can see, a religious man. And, And this man doesn't even get it. His wife is upset about the fact that she can't have children, and he's thinking, you got me. Men, sometimes we don't get it. Children, sometimes we don't get it. It doesn't make sense to us. Once, after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli, this is another man that comes into the story. Eli, he could be kind of like your pastor. Eli, the priest was sitting at the customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And as she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, I love this right here, then I will give him back to you. If you give me a son, God, I will give my son right back to you. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about how everything we have really belongs to God anyway. 
But I love her heart. She wants something from God. I wonder how many times we pray and we say, God, I I want a house, Lord. And if you give me a house, I will give that house right back to you. God, I want a car. And if you give me a car, I'm going to give it right back to you. I'm going to pick people up to take them to church. Lord, if I have a house and and you've given it to me, I'm going to use it to be hospitable to people, to invite people in, tell them about Jesus. Uh, Whatever you give to me, God, I'm going to give it right back to you. This is what Hannah is saying to God. I'm giving it right back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk? He asked. This is the pastor. She's, she's at the altar crying, weeping out to God. And, and the pastor comes up to her. Really, lady? You're going to come to church drunk? You know, again, it goes back to this idea that sometimes we don't get our moms. Sometimes we don't understand them. We don't know what's going on. Sometimes, frankly, I think moms don't even understand themselves. Like, like we don't know. We don't get them. Our children, we don't get our moms. Husbands, we don't get our moms. I'm going to tell you what uh, the wise words of a woman by the name of Lisa Nieves usually says to me. She goes, you don't have to get me. You got to love me. And she's right. A hundred percent. I don't have to get her. But I got to love her. Children, husbands, you don't have to get them. He's got to love him. And, and this right here, even a pastor. Her husband wasn't getting her. Her pastor wasn't getting her. He, they didn't know. We, we didn't get it. We didn't get it. Children, like you're really crying for children. Do you know what children do? You sure you want that? Like you know how expensive they are? Like, like, like you, do, you really, do you really want that, Hannah? And she's like, yeah, that, that's what I want. And here she is just weeping with so much sorrow that it looks like she's drunk. And, and he demanded, throw away your wine, her pastor tells her. And she said, oh no, sir. She replied, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged. And I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. You see, the reality is that our moms need to be commended more than they need to be criticized. It's so easy for us to be critical of them when we don't understand them, when we don't get them. And the reality is that we don't have to understand. We just need to stand with them. Stand with them. Be with them. I don't get why you're praying for a kid, but you know what? I'm going to pray with you for a kid. Uh, I don't get why you're crying for a kid, but I'm going to cry with you for a kid. Sometimes our moms just need someone to be there, stay with us, and just be there. Just our presence alone. And, And they need to be commended more than they need to be criticized by us. Because when we don't understand, it's easy for us to get critical. When we're not the ones in the situation, it's easy for us to get critical. When we don't know everything that's going on, it's easy for us to get critical. First Peter 3, 7 says this, In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding. As you live together, she may be the weaker, weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner. By the way, just because she's not just as strong as you are, does not mean that she's not equal in value. You might be stronger, but she's just as equal. And this, by the way, the feminist movement didn't come up with this. In fact, the feminist movement might say something totally different. Feminist movement might say, no, 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 she is just as strong as as you. No, that's, I mean, you could believe feminism or you can believe God. God says she's actually weaker. But just because she's weaker doesn't mean that she's not equal. She's equal. In fact, let me, let me, ladies, for a minute, I'll talk to you moms for a second, give you a little bit here. 
Ladies, I want you to know that the truth of the matter is, is that you may be maybe physically weaker than us, but you know very much that you are so much stronger in so many other ways. In fact, you're so strong that God realized that man could not do this alone. You're so strong that that God said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Adam, and, and I only can imagine the kind of trouble Adam was getting into in the Garden of Eden, and that God said, oh, 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 it's not good for man to be alone. I don't know if he was messing with the trees and things were discombobulated. I don't know what was going on, but it made God say, it's not good for man to be alone. And what does he say? I cre- I'll create a helper for him. Helper. Now, some of us see that word and we think, well, helper means assistant, demeaning, not a big deal. A helper. I don't want to be a helper. I want to be the boss. But if you only realize that men cannot do it without you, that men need your help. Not only do we see this in, in actuality or in scripture, but we see it in real life. How many men, unfortunately, have lost a spouse prematurely? And man, what do these men have to do almost immediately? They need to remarry as quickly as possible. You find a woman that has lost a spouse, and man, they could stay by themselves forever. And and never really need a man. It, It almost seems like they don't need that helper, but we do. I want you to know, women, you are every bit as equal to, to a man as, and that doesn't come from feminism, that comes from God, from the pages of scripture long before any kind of feminist movement. But she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Even God says, you don't treat your wife right, you don't treat your mom right, guess what? Your prayers will be hindered. You'll pray for stuff and I won't be listening because you need to learn to treat your wife right. For children, it says this, honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Again, uh, to children, he's saying, you honor your mom. You honor her. You honor your father, certainly, but you also honor your mother. Do you see how scripture even elevates women? Uh, Do you see how scripture, in fact, it's funny because some people say, oh, women in in the Bible times, they were so mistreated. Uh, but, But that's not the ethic that God was laying out. That's not what God was saying to do with women. In fact, the ethic of the Jews was better than the ethic that women had in the surrounding pagan communities. So if anything, you see that there's a better treatment of women in the Bible than even the other pagan nations of the time. The last mom I want to talk to you about is Mary. You see, Mary was in a really difficult situation when she was at the cross with Jesus. She was left there alone with John and just some other women. And uh, Mary was in a position where, again, we're talking about this idea that women needed the support of their husbands. They needed the financial support of their husbands because they couldn't just go out and get their own jobs. They couldn't just live on their own like women can live on their own today. Mothers, like Mary, sometimes need hope when they feel absolutely hopeless. I want to paint the picture for you here real quickly. Uh, When Jesus was dying on the cross, Mary wasn't just losing a son. Mary, scholars believe that uh, Joseph at this point had also passed away, so he wasn't around. In fact, the last time we hear uh, the name Joseph in Scripture is when Jesus was lost at about the age of 12. So Joseph is nowhere probably to be found. So when Mary is losing Jesus, not only is she losing her son, but she may even be losing her resources. 
She may even be losing. Like, how am I going to make it through life when I don't have a husband and I don't have a son that will take care of me, that can go out and work and bring home the bacon, if you will? How am I going to do that? So potentially, this is what was going on in Mary's life and what she was seeing on the cross. Again, probably not so concerned about the resources, but it had to have been a concern in the back of her mind to think that not only am I losing my son and how difficult difficult this is, but now I may also be losing my finances. I may be losing those things that I really need to survive. Mothers need hope when they feel helpless. I want to read the story real quickly. Standing near the cross where Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple, and it's speaking about John the Beloved, and from from then on, this disciple took her into his home. You know, the reality is, is that our mothers need to know that we're going to care for them. That we're going to be there for them. That no matter what happens, uh, mom, I want you to know that when it all falls apart, I want you to know you still have me. And, and, and it's only the right thing to do for our mothers. It's only the right thing after they've cared and been there for us for so many years, time and time again. It's only the right thing for us to turn around and be there for them. So we need to show our moms, hey, I'm going to give you hope. When all seems hopeless and all seems helpless, I will be there, mom. I will be there, wife. I will be there. How many of us as children, how many of us as husbands will say, I will be there. I will stand there right with you. One thing I've realized about women is that sometimes women just want that presence. They just want to feel that protection, that there is someone there with them. Look at what the Bible says. If we refuse to care for our mothers. Look at what the Bible says. Not just our mothers, but really our families. It says, but those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. I'm, I'm going to talk to to us here. If you are in a household, the reality is that the responsibility of that household isn't just the dads. It's not just the moms. It's the responsibility of everyone in that household. Hey, listen, I'm just as guilty of this as some of you, but I'm just going to... I'm just going to put it out there and say, well, I didn't hear this sermon. If I would have heard this sermon, I would have done things differently. But now you're accountable because you've heard this sermon. The reality is, is that it's the responsibility of everyone in the household to maintain the household. To make sure that the household has everything they need to have. Um, I'm just as guilty as anyone else, as any other teenager, as any other young adult. I'm just as guilty. That my money would come in and I'd spend my money on myself, all by myself, never even having a clue to what struggles were going on in my house. Maybe the, the bills were going unpaid and I had no clue. I was still buying myself new sneakers. And I was still buying myself, my, myself the stuff that I needed to buy. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to do those things. But, but really, we all need to be caring for those in our household. What does that mean? It means that as a child, you can go up to a dad. You can go up to a mom and say, hey, how's things going? And, and, and they don't even have to be living with you for you to ask those questions. Maybe some of our parents are out, like we're out of the house, they're in another house, and we don't know what they may be struggling with or not struggling with. With It's our responsibility to care for our relatives, especially those in the household. It's our responsibility. So many people want to put those responsibilities on the church, and as a 
church, we say, no, well, it's your responsibility to make sure that you have and that your parents have and that your children have, that you're caring for the people in your household. What did Jesus do with his mom? What did Jesus do? He provided someone for her. I'm not going to be here anymore, mom. I, I can't continue to provide for you, mom. And he's on the cross realizing that right now she probably felt really helpless, really hopeless. But he, he got someone that he could trust. Oh, he could trust John, the beloved. And he said, John, I won't be here, but I need you to take care of mom. I need you to be there for mom. I need you to do everything that I would have done for mom. You do it. And that's why he says, Here, here's your son. Here's your son. And, and mom, uh, and, and, and son, here, here's your mother. Here, here, you play that role. You care for my mom. You be there. And you say that, that's exactly why we put her in the nursing home. You care, <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> hey, listen, if, if you're, whatever you've got to do, I, I get it. There's, there's family situations, but, but make sure that, that you are the caregiver. Even if you leave her in someone else's hands you make sure that she is being properly cared for properly loved that she's not just abandoned somewhere that's what jesus did for his own mother so just a couple questions for you are we loving our mothers the way we should and and love by the way I, i know that we think that love is a feeling love is not a feeling yes there are feelings associated to love but love is more than a feeling it's a commitment and, and it's it's an action I can't say I love you if I'm not acting upon the love I need to act on it so this Mother's Day make sure let's make sure that we are acting out love that we're not just saying we love but but it's an act it's something that we're doing And you might say, well, yeah, but she never sees it. She never notices it. She never acknowledges it. It doesn't matter. What matters is that you're doing what you need to do for your mother because that's the right thing to do. That's what God would have you do. Moms, you know we can go on all day about that child that does one thing in the house and wants credit, right, for the next two years. I, thankfully, we don't have such a child in our home. But um, some of you have heard... Uh, But another thing, are we encouraging our moms? Are we going back to mom and saying, hey mom, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And and really encouraging them, saying, mom, you've done such a great job. You've done such a great job. Finding reasons to encourage, rather than finding reasons to constantly be critical. And the last thing is, are we offering hope to our moms? Are we letting them know, mom, Everything's going to be just fine because as long as you have me here, you have someone that's on your side. You have someone that's on your team. Mothers, you're doing a great, great job. Moms, you are phenomenal. The work you do is truly priceless. It's truly valueless, moms. But for us husbands, for us children, how are we showing our moms that we value them? For us, are we giving them hope? Are we loving them with our actions? Are we doing everything we can so that they are assured and reassured that we will always be there for them? It's crazy because it's almost as if roles are suddenly reversed. And we're so good about being care receivers. We're so good about, you know, I, you want to care for me, mom? You can care for me. No problem. Man, I know some moms that really spoil their kids, really spoil their kids. My, my wife has an, uh, an aunt, and uh, I love this aunt of hers, and, and you'll see why in just a moment. Her aunt is so hospitable. Uh, last time I went to her house, uh, some of you will know what this is. Uh, it's a piece of heaven, really. It's called an alcapurria. Uh, it's a piece of Puerto Rican heaven. It's a, it's a little thing. It doesn't look like heaven but it certainly tastes like heaven it's a little brown thing like that okay i'll just leave it at that but it, it's deliciousness of course it clogs up your arteries and all of that good stuff but it's it's just absolute deliciousness it's like to to translate it it's like chick-fil-a to the hundredth power like it's it's delicious it's the best thing uh, on earth 
her, her aunt, we went to her house and immediately I get there and she's like, hey, have a seat, have a seat. So I'm going to go have a seat at the table. No, 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 go sit at the sofa. And she puts me at the sofa and, um, and I didn't know this, but she, she sits me down and as soon as she sits me down, she presses the button for the recliner. So immediately my, my feet are up. She brings a little, uh, a table next to it. She brings me two alcapurrias with a cola champán. I mean, that was just heaven. I am with my legs up high. And, and she just told me, you can have as many as you want. Man. It's so good to be taken care of that way, right? It feels so good to, to receive that kind of care. Like, like I, I am like, hey, you know, this is good. Like, I could do this. When are we coming back here? I'd love to come back and visit you again. We are really good about receiving care. But how good are we about giving that care and demonstrating that care? Sometimes as husbands, sometimes as children, we take a full advantage and we really, we, we're, not, we're not even concerned about the fact that this person has given up everything for us, has just really just loved on us, has given us everything that they possibly could. Do you think it's time that maybe we can start being caregivers instead of just care receivers? But that we can change that mindset and say, no, I want to I wanna care for you now. Now you sit down. Now you get on the couch. Now let me press the button for the recliner. Now you eat the alcapurria that I made for you. I know we take this one day out of the year to make our moms feel special, but the reality is, is that this is something we can do consistently. So today, I know dads, uh, you're not loving me as much. I get it. But you know what? There's sweet revenge because there is a day in June where we will preach to our moms and children. (laughs) But for now, children, husbands, let us love our wives. Husbands, let's love our wives the way that Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? He gave himself up for her. And children, let's honor our moms. Let's honor our moms with all the honor that they deserve. And not just today, not just uh, taking advantage of them, uh, not just today where we say, oh, on Mother's Day, I'm going to love you. I'm, I'm going to make you feel real special on Mother's Day. No, uh, let's make them feel very special every single day. Amen. Let's pray.